Sister Josephine Mitchell has dedicated decades of her life bettering the foundations of education in Timor. Her passion for education has inspired many activists to this day. Listen as Sister Josephine reflects on her efforts and the struggles of educating the Timorese children under the Indonesian occupation of East Timor in the 1980s to the 1990s. We were invited to take up our work in Timor by Bishop Bello in 1993, who visited our main house in Mount Street, North Sydney, and asked our sisters if we could help him with education and health. And his main concern was they were losing their language, they were losing their identity, in other words, the Indianisation of their people. And when I first went there in 1994, having got through all the rigours of the uh, Indonesian security, the first word I saw on the, on the walls of the harbour was the word chains. Chains. And I learnt what this little country was like, a prison island. That's the only way I could describe it when I first... That was my experience. And I thought to myself, I cried because I thought, just 600 kilometres over there, I was free. We're free. Darwin, we're free. As a matter of fact, from the heights of Ramallau, I, you can actually see a haze, which they said to me is the lights of Darwin. And I thought, here they are in chains, and I'm over there free. And after the Delhi massacre, when many came to Australia, those who survived were pretty much on the blacklist. So I remember being there in one of the houses where there were two young men who'd been at the massacre. One had been shot, but survived. And I was there in the house and they were staying with their sister. And uh, she said to me, they are so frightened that if you hear a dog bark at night, they'll run for shelter. I remember speaking to one young man about his education when he was here in Australia. And I said, what was it like to be in high school, um, you know, when you were in Timor? And he said, I was so frightened, I couldn't learn. We were afraid all the time. Afraid for their own safety and afraid for their families. And I'm pretty sure when we arrived in the country, we'd be, well, we were followed by Indonesian bicycles would anywhere we'd go just about you'd have an Indonesian soldier's ex you know riding behind you. It was a land of silence as I experienced it. Very little talking certainly outside the house and even inside the house if we were speaking like this to people who would tr we would trust and they would trust us. You'd go in and sit down and they'd begin to whisper. They begin to talk to you in whispers. See, even, even the walls had ears. And, or one time we, we'd be often roadblocked. Every few kilometres you'd be roadblocked. And of course we had all our precious books that we were taking out to do workshops. And they were all in Tetum, which was a forbidden language. <laughs> there was no way they could be printed in Timor right at the beginning stages anyway. So we had to develop them down here. Bishop Bellow said that better for you to do get the books ready down here. So we had to get them into the country, didn't we? So we'd be carrying them in in our baggage or carrying... Uh, Jane carried a microscope once into the her... because um, she was de educating the sisters to identify TB virus. She carried a brand new... Um, microscope into the country and I said you'll never get that in I'll be on to you so when she got now this is her story when she got to the customs you know all fear and trembling praying to Mary McKillop and hoping um, the person said to her the man used to question you know open up the what have you got in that box she said a microscope and he said, what are you taking that in for? And she said, I'm, I'm, I'm researching a new form of malaria. <laughs> and he just said, OK. She walked in with a brand new microscope. <laughs> but now a lot of the books, we, we had to transport. We took our own books all over the country to the workshops. And a lot of them destroyed in 1992 with the big burner. 
Uh, but one memorable occasion I have when we were going to um, Balcal with our book, with all our books in the back, and we were roadblocked. This time by quite a cohort of military with M16s and an officer in charge. So he dragged the poor driver out, who was Timorese, and I thought, oh my God, what's going to happen here? And um, then he told the driver to get us, tell us to get out of the car, which we did. And in the back was all our books, see, so thinking, oh, what's going to happen here? So um, anyway, um, the driver said to them, these are Australian madre. And uh, anyway, they must have had a discussion about themselves and uh, among themselves, and they told us to get in and go. So, but at that stage, I thought, now this could be, this could be close to something. <laughs> you know, this could be it. But, um, but when we got to Balcao, uh, we found that the they were searching for people with um, weapons, and uh, they were really looking into our car for we you know guns and we were hiding resistance people. Um, but. I know several were arrested that day in well in the church in Balcal. Mm. So we had little scary, little interesting things like that happening. <laughs> the only place you could use tetum was in the church. And when you'd go into the church to a liturgy, it was like being in a different they were themselves, you know. But once you went outside, you never saw people walking together. Never a meeting. Bishop used to say to us, never meet outside the church property. So we actually were operating pretty much under his, his surveillance. It was after the, all the terrible burn up of Timor. 95% of the schools were burnt. In, um, see, the whole of Timor was a military operation. They just burnt a lot of it, destroyed the cattle, the crops and took life. But anyway, this little Besilau, it was a little school up near the mountain, beautiful part of the mountains. And um, when we went back there, it was no roof, practically no desks, everything burnt out. And do you know they had started with ordinary bamboo, building it up again, um, getting the, uh, they had little bamboo desks. And I said, who made those? So they said, the children. The children made those. So they start, and um, when we were in Dili, we first started looking for our t the teachers and so forth. We were going out to a school just not far from Dili and going along a little track. And I saw these teachers walking up the thing and I said, where are you going? This is only just not long after the whole big, prob you know, all the big burn up. I said, where are you going? I said, we're going to school. And I said, have you started school? Yes. And I said, who told you to start? And they said, we did. They just had gone back. If anyone sacrificed their life for me, then I would be eternally grateful for that. And I think that those people, whatever it was, they saw in the Australians something that they knew was the goodness. They knew that that was what they wanted to stand with. So I think that they're searching the same as I am for what is good and true and free, what it is to be a human person, what it is to have respect and dignity as a human person. Doesn't matter where you come from, um, what you believe, who you are. And um, I think that's what, that's what I'd be hoping for for them, that's why, I, I, that's why I'm still doing what I'm doing. What I can do at the moment is try and help those children from deprived backgrounds, especially the orphan children, to be cared for, to have food, to get, go to school, and to decide what I'd like to be with my life, and especially the girls. Mm. The Dominican Sisters Bread Kitchen Project. This project rides on the successful completion of a school canteen contributed to by Atlas in 2018. 
The canteen provides nutritious breakfasts and lunch meals for students and doubles as a home economics class, which teaches students and community nutrition and other domestic skills. In 2020, the school, with Atlas, offered to support the microfinance business of the women's staff at Escola Dominicana. This initiative of bread production benefits the community with a supply of clean and fresh bread. Atlas funded the purchase of a bread mixer. Using only two small ovens, the three staff, Beatrice, Elise, and Lydia, bake 300 loaves of bread a day. The customers are the parents and students. The school pays the minimum salary of the three women taken from the bread income. It is a great help for them since they are a sole provider for their family. Beatrice has three children and the husband in prison. Lydia has gone through a painful life. She has three children, ages six, five, and four years old, and is a widow. Emilita is 22 years old and is the eldest of seven siblings. She stopped schooling during her senior high school as the family could not afford her education. She shares her salary with the family in the mountains while she also saves for her studies next year. There is now an additional demand on the bread supply. Customers are coming from the community and the women must open the canteen as early as 6 a.m. Bread has become the traditional breakfast for the Timorese. Many people love the taste of bread with tea in the morning. Everything starts from a small beginning. Working in the bread kitchen gives the women a sense of confidence in themselves and an opportunity to live a dignified life. This will have a huge effect on the local community as the women will feel empowered to pursue greater things and inspire those around them. This is more than just making bread. It's accompanying people in the journey of life. The Scola Dominicana wants to expand the bakery to sell a variety of pastries that are nutritious and affordable for the community who live on or below the poverty line. The Scola Dominicana need a bigger size oven to facilitate this supply of bread and pastries. This year, Atlas is looking for funds to purchase that bigger oven and continue to support this great project that supports the local community in so many ways. Your continued support is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to contribute financially to this Atlas project, please visit our website to make a donation. There's a number of ways you can support Atlas, none of which involve money. Visit our website, atlas.org.au, and subscribe to our email newsletter. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Atlas East Timor. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash at East Timor. Thank you for your continued support.